Mathematica. 2021 no, has been a wonderful season, right? Yeah, yeah, it's been good. I, uh, I don't know what you think, though, but I think from our side, it's been pretty good. If you are just connecting, we are bringing you an exclusive interview with the president of the Ghana Football Association from Doha. We are reviewing 2021 uh, football season for Ghana. We'll look at the highs and the lows. We'll look at three different segments where we'll look at governance and administration. We'll look at the performance of the national teams as well as club football. Stick and stay with us. We are bringing you nothing but the best. As I said earlier on, uh, we are bringing you nothing but the best. This is an exclusive interview with the president of the Ghana Football Association. The first of its kind. He is granting this interview and that is going to be the first interview in 2022. We are reviewing 2021 football season for Ghana. We are looking at the highs and the lows. Don't forget that the national under 20 won the African Cup of Nations in 2021. A lot of other beautiful things that Ghana football achieved. Um, we shall be, you know, dwelling a lot uh, on all those things with the president of the association. Mr. President, how would you want me to, to address you, Mr. President, Director? What do you mean? Mathematica. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's been nice uh, having you once again. Uh, I'm very sure that by the time this you know, interview comes to an end, we are going to have a lot of information about Ghana football. Quick one. Um, how will you sum up 2021 football season for Ghana? Well, I, I, I think that um, 2021 was a very good year for us. If you look on your right and on my left, you see KGL, you see Puma, you see Bethel, you see Woodin, you see Awake. Um, Share Ghana beyond the return. Clearly, these are key indicators. For, for anybody at all to see that um, there are a lot of people, especially from the private sector, who are seeing the positives that football can offer um, the country. Generally, I think that um, we had a very good year. Um, some amazing stories uh, were told. We had some few challenges, I must be honest. But that's the essence of, uh, of a building process. That's the essence of a changing process. Um, change, we always say, is a very, very difficult uh, uh, process. But when it is that people believe in the vision, uh, when it is that people um, are able, or one is able to put people the right levels of, of skill sets together, and they believe in the vision and they pursue the vision, obviously, you expect that the end will, will be good. So I'll say that uh, generally, and in very, very broad terms, uh, the future of our today looks very, very good because of what happened yesterday. We, we are bringing you this interview uh, in three different segments. Uh, the first segment will certainly start on the high, where we will look at the national teams. And of course, I think that is what you want to hear. We'll look at uh, administration and the work of the GFA as a secretariat. Then we Climax it all with club football. Hearts of folk who won the league, uh, they went to Africa, a whole lot of things happened. We will look at that at the tail end of it. Mr. President, let's start with the national teams. The National U20 started a very wonderful project from 2020, winning the Wafu in Benin. And in 2021, they just strike the match with another wonderful win uh, in Mauritania the African Cup of Nations. What went into it and how was this achieved? Well, I, I would want to start from, from uh, um, a very bold decision by the board or the executive committee to set up uh, our national U15 uh, boys and girls team. For me, that was a bold statement uh, because it's very important for, for us to have a clear pathway for the development of our intangible assets, which are the players. So we, we brought uh, our national U15 boys back. We brought our national U15 girls back. And for me, that gladdens my heart a lot. And I'm sure to many of us on the executive committee. Now, fast forward, uh, we competed in the U17 waffle competition. We also competed in the U20 waffle competition. Unfortunately, the U17 boys could not make it. Um, 
under very, very challenging circumstances. But the U20 uh, never gave up, um, won the waffle competition, and went on to complete, completely dominate the, the African continent. Um, so we are the African champions. And this is what gladdens my heart a lot. Um, in the years that Ghana were very dominant, or was very dominant at the youth level, U17 and U20, our national teams, especially the A national team, was very, very strong. Um, in the years of 2006, 2010, 2014, where Ghana was ever present at every youth international meet, our A national teams were very strong. So, so for me, as a leader of this family, my single ambition is to ensure that for every international meet at a youth level, Ghana is, is, is represented, and it represented pretty well. And uh, I'm very happy that the U20 made us proud. And obviously from the U20, we've had the likes of Dalad, Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim the likes of Fatao, uh, Ishaku, the likes of Philip Philemon Bafo, um, all gaining um, promotion to the A national team of Ghana. And that's what we, we set out to achieve. Um, beyond that, we, we also reorganized the national U17 girls. National U17, uh, U20 girls, they are all in camp. They've been in camp from day one. Uh, the Black Queens, unfortunately, were paired against Nigeria. The mm. two superpowers on, yeah. on, in, in, in the west coast of Africa, and unfortunately, one had to go home, and the Black Queens lost out. But that tells you clearly the quantum of energy and effort this football association is investing in the female game. Um, I think that we are encouraging more female participation in the sport across all facets of the football ecosystem, be it by way of governance in refereeing, uh, also via the academy on refereeing policy, um, by way of personnel who administer our female national teams, giving access to females to be, to be coaches uh, via our newly introduced, obviously, uh, the coaching uh, educational sector, uh, coach license D and C, uh, which will be coming up soon um, but i think that there's a general push for women's football in this country and uh, the the performance of hazakes ladies uh, at the waffle tournament the performance of hazakes ladies at the african champions league speaks volumes of of the quantum of the intangible assets that we have here and also about the quality of investment that we we have in in, in the female game so uh, on national team front, I think that it's been very, very positive, um, both at the male side and at the female side. We will zoom on into the Black Stars, but mentioning female football and the national team angle, the Black Queens couldn't qualify for the African Cup of Nations and by extension the World Cup. Ashisha Toshola, who plays for Nigeria, made a very strong statement that she thinks the, the new format of the qualification that pairs Ghana and Nigeria against each other as in the best format and you being a very good president of the of the of, uh, friend of the calf president uh, will you be pushing for this particular format to be changed well i think i've taken this 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 discussion to the to a very highest level of african football governance uh, i don't think that the current structure and format is is, is fair enough uh, same is like if, same uh, is the opinion also of my colleague from from nigeria uh, president uh, pinnick and a few others, and, and I think that it's something that the Competitions Department of, of the Confederation of African Football is having a look at, uh, because we've made a, a good case for, for CAF to really look at the format of, of, of the competition. At the end, Africa has to be represented by the best teams, okay? Now, beyond that, I've also been calling for a special qualification tournament for the Women's World Cup, okay? Okay. I mean, pitching both the AFCON women and the World Cup together for me is, is not, it's not a good strategy. We should have a different qualification tournament for the women for the World Cup and a separate competition for the AFCON women. And uh, it's something that I'm pushing. And uh, at the Executive Council level at CAF, I'm, go I'm going to pick up and follow up with this conversation. 2021 was also a year of a lot of friendly matches for the national teams. Um, for the first time, perhaps in the history of Ghana football, we saw almost all the national teams, you know, traveling to play football matches. The U17 went to Morocco, you know, the U20, uh, the U23, Azerbaijan, the local blasters, and 
almost all the national teams were playing football matches. The motive? Well, when we set out to work uh, in the year uh, or for the year 2021, I had uh, a lengthy discussion with the, the national teams department and the target was to ensure that all our national teams are exposed to, to competitions, to, to, to games, um, to expose our players, to give them the right levels of confidence when it comes to competition proper. Um, so our single ambition was to ensure that we, we open doors for every national team to be active. So from the U17 boys and girls up to the A teams, we, we found a way to keep everybody in in games and, and I think that that is that is the way to go um, indeed in this new year we intend to follow the same strategy to ensure that both boys and girls always have friendly games or, or international games to, 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 to participate in it's part of the general developmental agenda of, of this football association and uh, that would only go a long way in, in, in in improving the confidence of the players, the drinker team, and everybody who is part of the developmental agenda of, of, the, of our own football association. And now the Blasters, they had a, a very difficult, or let me say, a tumultuous journey in qualifying for the African Cup of Nations, which they are currently in Doha preparing for the tournament. And then the World Cup playoffs, the journey in securing a ticket for the African Cup of Nations. Give us the details. Well, I think that. Um, Normally, given the history of our Black Stars, given the history of Ghana, and given the kind of teams that we had to compete against, uh, normally everybody would expect that the whole the Black Stars would clear everybody. Okay, um, but the truth of the matter is that the the Black Stars had been unstable, um, not only by way of 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 tanker direction, but also by way of of personnel, and and and, and therefore. It was always going to be a big fight amongst the less endowed uh, football nations, so to say. But at the end, the team achieved. The team achieved qualification. I mean, we shouldn't take anything away from the team. They went for it. They qualified. And, and now, gradually, the team is having a more stable character, uh, more stable personnel. And uh, I believe that we have a very... Um, good assembly of some of the very best talents Ghana can have currently. Um, I have so much confidence in, the, in this squad. Um, youth or age is on, on their side and I think that this team will soon dominate the African continent and, and, and beyond. Um, I believe that we, as we prepare for, for the AFCON, um, the platform that AFCON presents will give each one of these players the opportunity to show what they, to show what they are made of. Did you at a point in time felt that Ash Ghana may not be able to qualify looking at the difficulty of the journey and for that uh, one? Yes. No, 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 no way. I always believed in the squad. I believed that the Tinker team had done enough for us to make it. Um, at that time, Siki Akono and his guys, I think, did enough to, to ensure that we qualified and we did qualify. Um, now, qualification is behind us. The team is improving by the day and uh, we only have to support our own. That's what I believe in. Now the World Cup qualifying and, and that is where the drama <laughs> <laughs> was really centered. <laughs> After going through you know, <coughs> a difficult journey, going to South Africa, playing Ethiopia there, playing against Zimbabwe on our way, playing against South Africa away there, losing that game. And then the final game in Cape Coast. Describe your situation. When what, what it, kind of situation? When it was left with about 15 <laughs> minutes to end the game. <laughs> no, I mean, um, I mean, South Africa would always be a good team. Okay, will always be a good opponent. Let me put it this way. Mm. And and therefore, given what was at stake, I always knew it was going to be a difficult game. Um, Ghana needed to win. South Africa needed to avoid defeat. Therefore, the stakes were very, very high. Uh, but if you, if you were with a team that is with our Black Stars, if you had a close look at the, the level of comradeship, the level of determination on the faces of each one of them, including the captain of the side, I had no doubt 
there was no doubt whatsoever in my mind that on that day we would score a goal and make it to the next level okay and and what we saw of the team that day gives all of us hope for 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 the future this this was a team of 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 brave warriors who truly truly wanted to make themselves and and Madagana proud and they fought for everything that day and i wasn't surprised that at the end we won and we deserve to win before the final whistle we saw the posture of the sports minister honorable mustafa yusif when he was virtually unable to sit but you were very calm enjoying the game what what, what made that difference because he no, virtually no i mean we are we are we are two different people we react emotionally to situations differently uh, honorable mustafa obviously an ardent uh, uh, supporter of our blasters would always want the blasters to make it to the highest level so he was in the game himself he was he was playing he was he was he behaved as he was part of the players on the pitch he was very deep into the game um so so were all of us um and we reacted to the situation in, in, in different manners uh, uh, but both of us were emotional uh, obviously and that poured out at the end of the game um i think it was a very very difficult challenge but through the mighty god through the mercies of the almighty god we went through I've always believed that God will, will see us through and um, he's never failed me, especially throughout this journey. And on the third day and that moment, he spoke and he spoke very loud. Going into the tournament uh, in, in Cameroon uh, this month, the, obviously people are expecting Ghana to end the 40-year trophy drought. You have been the GFA president. Take off the spectacles of being the GFA president. Be a Ghanaian. <laughs> <laughs> Be a Ghanaian, and then from your interactions with the players, from what you have seen in the camp, from the atmosphere around the team, what are your expectations? To put it blindly, uh, I expect this team to go all the way. I've never seen a collection of young but united warriors like we currently have in the squad. 28 warriors ready to represent their, their country, ready to make our dear country proud. And I, I, I think that um, the atmosphere around the team, the preparations, the work of the Tinker team would eventually pay. Um, uh, I've always said that when it comes to talent, perhaps we can match up against any country on the African continent. And this team is full of talent and the talent will show on the pitch and the talents will show in Cameroon, believe me. As you can see, um, for those of us here and the president of the Ghana Football Association, who for once took off the spectacle of being the GFA president to become a Ghanaian, the expectation is that... I can take it off again if you want. <laughs> <laughs> the expectation is that the Black Stars are able to end the 40 year, you know, Afghan trophyless drought uh, for Ghana. But without structures, without administration, Football certainly will not be able to thrive. The structures and the administration of football form the skeleton with which football is able to move. Now, there were several policies that we saw, you know, clearly manifesting into 2021. Uh, one of such policies is the catch them young policy, where we saw a lot of young referees officiating. We, we, we saw the coaching courses, especially with the with the with the license D coaching courses where a lot of even active players were taking part in the course and refereeing a whole lot of things were done in 2021. Let's look at the highlights. Certainly I know you talk about the catch them young policy. Tell us a lot about it. Well I would I would want okay before I speak about the Cadem Young, which is my pride, um I want to talk about refereeing in general. Um, taking cognizance of where we, we, we started this journey, okay? Um, we came at a time that uh, the Anas Expose had taken away about 77 of our most experienced referees. We were faced with the, with the window of we introducing new ones and we identifying new ones, okay? Um, so we, we, we first of all had to identify 
the problems within the refereeing sector. And what we did was to set up the various facets of the refereeing structure to ensure that there's a clear division of responsibility. What did we do? We had at the top the referees committee, and below the referees committee we had the match review panel, we had the um, grading and classification uh, panel, we had the fiscal and strategics panel, and then we had the um, technical and strategics panel, or, or committee, whatever you call it. And, and all the committees hold different responsibilities and have different powers. And that ensures that there's equity and good spread of responsibility across board. Then we we'll look at investing in, in training of referees, and we've invested across board by way of training, capacity building I'm talking about here. So either fiscal instructors went through training, Match commissioners went to training, mm. uh, technical instructors went to training, okay. referees went to training. We had also integrity training taking place. Uh, <clears throat> we had communications in refereeing taking place, etc., uh, etc. Et okay. Then, then we we said, look, hey, okay, we have a large pool of referees, but what is the pathway for referees in this country? Let's go down again. And and what we did was to introduce what has become known as the Cardem Young Refereeing Policy, where kids from the age of 10, 11, 12, up to 18, 19, 20, were, were, were given the opportunity to express their passion, to join the free, and, and to be taught the art of refereeing. And, and this we have done across all the 10 regions. Currently, we have close to a 1,000 of young boys and girls who have expressed interest and who have gone through various forms of, of training in, in officiating. This, this was truly represented during the, the KGL U17 Club Champions League where products from the Cardem Young Refereeing Policy were given the platform to be part of the U17 Soccer Fiesta. And this is what gladdens my heart. I mean, if you look at the talents, nobody will tell you that Ghana holds a big future in refereeing. And, and very soon, we're going to produce the super refereeing again on the African continent. Um, we're going to stick with this strategy. We're going to invest more in, in the young boys and girls. And, and I believe that refereeing in general would improve. Don't forget that we've had enhanced uh, compensation for referees in this country when they officiate games. We've also introduced our partnership with STC, um, where STC is a partner uh, for, for our leagues, um, the Women's League, the Division One League, and the, and the, and the GPL. Um, all this is geared towards improving refereeing in this country. Plus, the sponsorship from ZAS that ensure that all the referees mm. uh, have neatly sewn uniforms Kids, uh, yeah. um, um, for their personal usage during the season. So, refereeing has been key on the agenda and I think that we've been very proactive. I mean, referees who <coughs> have not who have who have not who have not been up to speed, obviously, are, are taken through the um, due process, i.e. when clubs complain about bad officiating, etc., etc. The match review panel is there to have a look at, at the performances and, and advice accordingly. So I think we are on the right track. Um, refereeing will definitely be on the rise. Um, it will not take one day. Don't forget, we also invested in communication guidance to move. Now, there were several policies that we saw, you know, clearly manifesting in 2021. Uh, one of such policies is the Catch Them Young policy, where we saw a lot of young referees officiating. We, we, we saw the coaching courses especially with the with the with the license D coaching courses where a lot of even active players were taking part in the course and refereeing a whole lot of things were done in 2021 let's look at the highlights certainly i know you talk about the Catch young policy tell us a lot about it well i would i would want okay before i speak about the Catch young which is my pride um i want to talk about refereeing in general um, taking cognizance of where we, we, we started this journey, okay. Um, we came at a time that uh, the Anas Expose had taken away about 77 of our most experienced referees. We were faced with the, with the window of we introducing new ones and we identifying new ones, okay. Um, so we, we, we first of all had to identify 
the, the problems within the refereeing sector. And what we did was to set up the various facets of the refereeing structure to ensure that there's a clear division of responsibility. What did we do? We had at the top the referees committee, and below the referees committee we had the match review panel, we had the um, grading and classification uh, panel, we had the fiscal instructors panel, and then we had the um, technical instructors panel, or, or committee, whatever you call it. And, and all the committees hold different responsibilities and have different powers. And that ensures that there's equity and good spread of responsibility across the board. Then we will look at investing in, in training of referees. And we've invested across the board by way of training, capacity building I'm talking about here. So either fiscal instructors went through training, match commissioners went through training, mm. uh, technical instructors went through training, okay. referees went through training. We had also integrity training taking place. Um, we had communications in refereeing taking place, etc., uh, etc. Et okay, then, then we, we said, look, hey, okay, we have a large pool of referees, but what is the pathway for referees in this country? Let's go down again. And, and what we did was to introduce what has become known as the Kajem Young refereeing policy, where kids from the age of 10, 11, 12, up to 18, 19, 20, were, were, were given the opportunity to express their passion to join the free and, and to be taught the act of refereeing. And, and this we have done across all the 10 regions. Currently we have close to a thousand of young boys and girls who have expressed interest and who have gone through various forms of, of training in, in officiating. This, this was truly represented during the, the KGL U17 Club Champions League where products from the Academy Young Refereeing Policy were given the platform to be part of the U17 Soccer Fiesta. And this is what gladdens my heart. I mean, if you look at the talents, nobody will tell you that Ghana holds a big future in refereeing. And, and very soon, we're going to produce the super refereeing again on the African continent. Um, we're going to stick with this strategy. We're going to invest more in, in the young boys and girls. And, and I believe that refereeing in general would improve. Don't forget that we've had enhanced uh, compensation for referees in this country when they officiate games. We've also introduced our partnership with STC, um, where STC is a partner uh, for, for our leagues, uh, the Women's League, the Division One League and the, and the, and the GPL. Um, all this is geared towards improving refereeing in this country. Plus, the sponsorship from ZAS that ensure that all the referees Mm. Uh, have neatly sewn uniforms Kids, uh, yeah. um, um, for their personal usage during the season. So, refereeing has been key on the agenda, and I think that we've been very proactive. I mean, referees who <coughs> have not, who have, who have not, who have not been up to speed, obviously, are, are taken through the um, due process, i.e., when clubs complain about bad officiating, etc., etc. The match review panel is there to have a look at, at the performances and, and advice accordingly. So I think we are on the right track. Um, refereeing will definitely be on the rise. Um, it will not take one day. Don't forget, we also invested in communication gadgets sure. for, for uh, match officials. And we're going to invest in more communication gadgets very soon. Um, we're part of the team that are currently uh, engaging uh, CAF and FIFA for the introduction of VAR in, in Ghana. So. So I think that we are in the right way. I think every father will be proud to see the son becoming the president of the country or the president of the GFO, rising high on top in the world. And you will certainly be proud to see a Ghanaian referee officiating in the World Cup. But if a Ghanaian referee from this catch them young policy happens to be the referee for the finals of the World Cup one day, one maybe day. in 15 or in 20 years time, how will you describe your feeling? I'm sure I wouldn't find the right adjectives. I mean, uh, I'm sure, <coughs> I'm sure, the Almighty God will allow me to 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 be part of that uh, occasion. Um, but I'm proud that Ghana, as a key MA on the African continent, has introduced the Kadem Young Refereeing Policy, and I'll I'll respectfully ask all member associations to look at that strategy because that is the future. If we invest in in young boys and girls as footballers. 
why don't we invest in young boys and girls as, as referees? Why don't we invest in young boys and girls as match coordinators, for example, or match commissioners, for example, at a much younger age? That is the way to go. And, and very soon we're going to introduce match coordinators from this policy, um, uh, match commissioners from this policy. It's coming. Uh, apart from the catch them young, you know, refereeing policy, which is certainly developing referees for the game, we also have young players, young footballers from the under-15 level who played in the KGL, you know, under-17 tournament in, in, just recently. Then the coaching course. Let's talk about the coaching course before we come to the, 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 the young players who are playing. License D, you know, was done across board all over the country, all the regions. And we saw a lot of even active players. And key amongst them is Yaya Mohammed, you know, taking part in this particular course. It, I, I saw a post that you did on, on, on social media, you know, explaining how happy you were seeing Yaya Mohammed take part in that particular course. Does it satisfy your objective? I think that, first of all, the, the end goal is to offer the D license to everybody who is interested as a beginner to enter into the field of coaching. I'm told you took part yourself. Uh, not yet, not yet, <laughs> not yet. I, unfortunately, I missed the date because I was out of jurisdiction. Um, but uh, we've been offering the D license across all the 10 regions, as many as we can. And I'm extremely happy that players like Imano Klote and Ya Mohamed took the opportunity to educate themselves even when they, they, they were still uh, active players. And that is very, very positive. Um, going to coaching very early in your career is a big sign that, that you, you, can, you can make it, okay? Uh, I also saw uh, Don Botti, Eric Bequin, yes, that's Joe Tegu. Very, very, that's very, very positive. You know. And um, just like um, I have said much earlier, uh, capacity building is key for me, okay? And I believe that giving people the opportunity to learn and to share ideas is the only way our industry can grow. So you, you've seen that we've been very, very aggressive with capacity building, whether by way of administration, by way of coaching, um, by way of um, other need areas of, of the football ecosystem. We've been very, very proactive and we're not gonna stop with, with, with the capacity building. Um, soon we're going to roll out the license D, uh, license C and license B and license A, hopefully all coming soon. The whole idea is to ensure that our coaches are up to speed with the happenings in, in coaching in, in, in the world. The KGLU 17 tournament, the concept and how it began, you know, I think a lot of people even realized that there was such a tournament when it was played on the national stage. It was given television coverage, a lot of people had the opportunity of watching it live on other social media handles. How was the concept developed and how was the you know, preliminary stages played before they came to the national side? Well, so, so right from the word go, I offered myself to be chairman of the National Juvenile Committee as the president of the FA. And at the National Juvenile Committee level, uh, one of the key things that we, we settled on was to ensure that juvenile football was brought back alive in Ghana, in all the regions, um, and to ensure that we give the RFAs good support in, in, that, in, in that direction, okay? So we, we ensured that registration of players took place. We ensured that all the leagues in all the regions took place and they took place very, very successfully. Now, at the end of the season, the champions from the various regions obviously qualified to participate in the KGL um, Interclub U17 Championship, which was staged in Accra. All the regions were represented by their champions with the exception of uh, Greater Accra and Ashanti region that were represented by two clubs each. So in total, we had 12 clubs. We, we did form an LOC uh, chaired by Dr. Um, uh, Magdan uh, Macaulay. Okay. Um, and they ensured that the competition was very, very well organized. Um, like you rightly said, the competition, we had, we had um, referees, products from the Kadem Young Refereeing Policy, mm. being the match officials for, for the tournament. And I believe that every young boy who participated in this competition went home very excited because already they are national heroes. Mm. Um, first time juvenile football was live on free-to-air TV and on social media platforms. Almost all the games were broadcasted. This is unprecedented in the history of Ghanaian <coughs> football. 
um, the super talents that have come out have already gained national recognition. Some of them are receiving collapse to the National U17 to have and a go. And that is the transitional plan. Exactly, to have a go. And from there, they have their careers in, in front of them. So I think that uh, I am, I'm very happy about this. Uh, uh, beyond, beyond this competition, we also introduced the Women's Super Cup. We also introduced the DOL Super Cup. And uh, there's one more competition that I'm going to propose to the ESCO for us to introduce in, in this particular year. And what uh, is that going to I'm, be? I'm not the blessing of the ESCO first, but there's one more. And, and my idea for this year is to take all the competitions to every corner of the country, not only by TV, but by way of organization. So, for example, you have Volta Region organizing one of the competitions. You have Central Region organizing one of the competitions. You have maybe Western Region also being the host region for another competition. We're going to take all the competitions to the, all, every corner of the country. Now, let's look at um, um, still on administration. Um, the RFS, uh, this time around, seem to have been cushioned with a lot of support in terms of footballs, in terms of babes, in terms of training equipment, in terms of even financially. Uh, you know, how, where do you get money to do all these things and how are you able to sustain all these things? Well, the, the RFA, first of all, is the responsibility of the executive committee and the FA to recognize that the RFAs are part of the governance structure of football in this country. They truly represent the national secretariat at the regional level. Mm for which reason they also need support, they need resources, even though they are also mandated to, to look for their own funding. Okay, so, so what we decided to do was first of all to support the, the RFA chairman. So for the first time, every RFA chairman do receive monthly allowance from the Football Association. This has never been the case. Oh, really? Okay? This has never been the case. So we have started with monthly financial support for our RFA leadership across the 10 regions. Beyond that, there is the, the annual subvention that we, we do send to the RFAs for the running of the offices and for payment of salaries of, of some of the staff at, at the various regions. The FA also decided to invest 100,000 US dollars in footballs and these footballs were distributed to the RFAs across the country for regional and grassroots football development. Beyond that, um, the FA also invested about 280,000 um, US dollars in the borehole strategy, and the boreholes are being currently constructed across all the regions. Uh, some of the game centers, game centers that are controlled by the RFAs are also direct beneficiaries of the borehole strategy. The whole idea is that we want to support the RFAs to be able to, to really execute their mandate, okay? The one million USD five-year relationship we've had with KGL will be also to support juvenile football across the country. In the new year, we're going to invest in their trophies, in the medals, in some footballs that the RFAs are going to use in the organization of the juvenile leagues across the country, okay? Um, if the RFAs do well, Ghana football will, will do good. So. So it's very, very important for everybody or for us to place premium on the work of the RFS. And this is exactly what we're doing. Finance and sponsorship and investment, apart from the, the annual you know, support financially that you receive from FIFA, can we quantify the, the, the sponsorship packages that you get as a Ghana Football Association in terms of money? Well, I think I don't, I don't have all the figures of head, um, but... Clearly, the newly established marketing department headed by Jamel Marabi have been working very well. Um, in the new year, my intention is, is, is for the ESCO to add at least two more uh, personnel to the department um, because of the workload um, to ensure that we are able to be very aggressive in the market to look for more partners and more resources. Um, obviously, we do receive support from FIFA. Um, we do receive some support from Puma. Um, and, uh, we do receive some support from CAF, from the Confederation of African Football, but that's all that there is. Um, fortunately, through our relationships that we have set up, whether via Awake or Beyond the Return or by Woodin or advertising during games, national team games, we're able to bring in some few money, monies here and there. And that's what we use in supporting all the, the developmental agenda of the Football Association. We'll be leaving the finance and administration center, but 
before we say goodbye to that particular area, does the GFA have investment outlets apart from say maybe somebody comes to hire a facility at Pram Pram, pays a token for the usage of the facility? Uh, do you have investment outlets that also bring in no, something at the to moment, the, to at the, the moment, association? No, but it, it's something that we intend to really harness with, with, with our project in Pram Pram. Uh, Pram Pram will definitely receive a facelift beginning this new year and uh, we hope that the facelift will enable us to, to bring in some money via the project that will be set up in Pram Pram. Uh, because clearly there's a need for us to diversify revenue streams and look at non-conventional ways of bringing money to the Football Association. Club football, we have uh, the Ghana Premier League, we have the Division One League, we have the Women's Premier League, the Women's Division One League. Then we have this KGL Championship that was introduced, we have juvenile football, a whole lot of competitions. I didn't know too much for the FA. Um, no, I think that uh, uh, we even have to do more. We have to introduce more because that's the essence of development. Um, we need to create products that are attractive, products that will excite the people. And we, we need to, to give opportunities to every kid in the country to play association football. That is the essence. And uh, the competitions that we currently have, in my opinion, are just not enough. Let's start with the Ghana Premier League in 2021. Your assessment of how the league went and uh, up to the end, we saw Hasafo winning the league. Well, I, I think that that was one of the best seasons I've seen in recent times. Um, the energy levels from the clubs, the quality of play, quality of officiating, um, normal football ambience that we created at, at the football games. I remember clearly. Um, the game involving Hearts of Oaken Olympics in my mind. I remember clearly the game between Hearts of Oak and Kotoko. Um, I remember the duels between Dreams FC and Kotoko at Dewu, Dreams FC and Hearts of Oak at Dewu, and many, 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 many more. I remember the battle between Gold Stars and Summertex, Gold Stars and Sky FC. In the Division One uh, League. I remember clearly the battles between uh, Tamayu, R R RTU, RTU and uh, Tamale City, Bafakwatano and BA United, uh, Tamayu and Accra Lions. I mean, amazing games, amazing football atmosphere, um, uh, amazing coverage. I mean, we, we took football to, to, to millions of homes, which is unprecedented. One weekend, you have WPL games live. You have DOL games live, you have uh, GPL games live, and you don't know even which one to watch at the same time, okay? That's where the, the work of the competition department comes into play. And that's why they are taking scheduling very, very much serious this time around, because it's important that we offer everybody the opportunity to watch games uh, as and when they want, okay? Uh, start times are broadcasting more games. The GFA are streaming a lot of games. Now we have the GFA app that will ensure that games will come into millions of, of homes across the country and beyond. So I think that we've given, we've given a lot of, of, of opening to, to people to have access to the Ghanaian game. And, um, and, and, and digitization of football or the marriage between the digital world and football is, is taking much more prominence than ever before. So. I'm extremely happy about, about, about the future. Of, that, of the that, that brings in a question again. I'm, I'm still much concerned about how you're able to raise the financial backbone to support all this investment. Because you talk about the Division One League alone, and you have about 24 matches every weekend, and you have maybe about six matches that should come live on TV for people to watch. You know, that is social media, Facebook. You have Women's Premier League games. You have juvenile matches all being streamed on social media for people to watch. And we know social media is free. So regardless of the numbers that come up there, the effort it gets nothing, but you get the money, you know, go in, invest in gadgets and all the other things to, you know, put all these games up there. Where do you get the money? Well, I'll say, let me, let me, let me be honest. I think that... Uh, is the FA that rich? Uh, uh, let me say that the, the marketing department of the FA, again, led by Jamel Marabi, uh, have, been, have been amazing to be honest. Um, 
Uh, yes, we've relied on, 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 on our relationships that we have created to bring in some, some, some revenue or mm. some inflows mm. that has supported all these developmental strategies that we, we, have, had, we have ruled out. Okay, it's not been easy, to be honest with you. Uh, the support from FIFA has come in handy all the time. The support from CAF has always come in handy. And uh, I think that if we are able to strengthen the marketing department, given the way the communications department have been working, I think that um, the FA is opening up a lot more and uh, there will be more partners and there will be more money coming through. Under your administration, we've seen a marketing department for the FA which previously did not exist. Which other departments have you created under your umbrella? Well, when we, when we set out in the beginning, obviously, I did say that I, I would want to lead a setup that will ensure that there's an efficient national secretariat. An efficient national secretariat here means we're finding the right personnel to fill the various departments that we had identified. And, and, and one wants to talk about the, the identified departments. Uh, the FA had never had an HR department. Yeah. We do have an HR department. Uh, we set up a marketing department, a competitions department. We re-enhanced the, the finance department with new personnel. Um, uh, of course, the integrity department, the, um, national teams department. Uh, all this ensured that uh, we, we, we brought more efficiency in the system. Uh, people specialized in, in, in their niche areas and, and that is helping in the, in the forward match of our football association. Um, there's a new feel when you enter the premises of the Football Association yeah. because of the new way we, we're, doing, we're doing the business of football. And I, I think that if we carry on going like this, uh, the game would improve. We introduce a same-day service uh, for people who make requests for introductory letters, etc., etc. And we are striving to make it even more efficient. Um, I, I think that we, we are in the right way. We, we resource the communications department and you can see that the FA is very visible and open on all fronts. Um, we, we, we've opened up the FA for people to have all news items that they want, every information that they want, it's, it's available. Uh, we introduced the GFA News, which is also a news outlet. We revamped the official website. Um, we brought more energy into our Twitter platforms, our Facebook platforms, our Instagram platforms. Um, I, I think that we've made the FA a lot more visible mm. for people. Um, for want to avoid the the FA has become a lot more appealing to, to the to, to the consumers of football. And information is available everywhere. Uh, you go on the website, it's up to speed. You go on Twitter, there's news. GFA news is coming up. Uh, news items. Now we introduce the. Another online representation, which is the app, the GFA, Ghana Football app, and we're just carrying the, the, the food to the doorstep of the consumer. Are we going to see the FA once having maybe a research and statistics department, considering all the departments that you have now? I think, I think that it's, 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 it's very, very important. Um, data collection is one data keeping is another and, and it's important that we, we move into that era where we we'll collect a lot more data uh, and archive the data so that the data will stand the test of time because it, at times it's, it's quite disappointing when people want certain levels of information and it's simply not available or informations are distorted and facts are distorted uh, which, which is not what we want okay so definitely um, that, that department will be coming up soon. Following their photo finish at the end of the season, Hearts of Oak failed to impress on the African continent. And a lot of people have argued uh, that it's perhaps because of the quality of our league. And an official of the club even made that particular pronouncement. You, you look at the performance of Hearts of Oak and you just oppose it to their performance in the league. Do you agree with people who believe that the standard of the league is the reason Hearts of Oak could not perform in Africa? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I think specifically with Hearts of Oak, uh, a lot of factors went into um, the way things went uh, for them. Um, I think that if they were to compete again today, uh, things would look different. 
Um, I think our league was and is very, very competitive. It's also true that when you want to compete in the Champions League, it's important for you to look at your squad, augment your squad, and make sure that you have the right levels of, of, of intangible assets for the platform in which, or on which you're going to compete. So uh, I think that Hearts of Oak clearly have learned their lessons. Uh, they had not been on that path for so long, so obviously uh, they had lost some of the time. Um, and I believe that if they have the opportunity again of competing in Africa, they'll do, they'll do much, much better. Do, Just like any other club in the, in, in, in the league. Do you sometimes feel worried, you know, when your name is mentioned following wrong calls from referees, especially in the Ghana Premier League? I'm not, I'm not worried, but I'm, I'm, I sometimes get concerned, okay? Um, because obviously, as a leader of this family, if things are good, somebody will mention your name. If, if things turn out to be bad, somebody will mention your name. It, it's normal in, 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 in our chosen careers. Uh, but, but when my name comes up, it tells me that there's, there's a need for us to continue with our way of doing the business, especially with capacity building, with information sharing, with communication, and with engaging. And, and for me, that is the motivation that I drive when my name comes up every day. Um, and uh, I will not renege on that effort to ensure that our people are educated, our people are engaged, our people get the right levels of, of information they want. And we open our doors at, at all times to our people when they want to engage us. One of the key issues that showed its head in the Division One League last season was hooliganism, and especially in the Zone One you know, of the, of the Division One League. How is the FA handling that particular situation this time around? Well, I think that um, last year we had to do a lot of work um, just to ensure that people continue to believe in the system, people, for people to, to know that referees will not intentionally come to games uh, with predetermined mindsets. But most importantly, to reassure members that, look, um, we would continue to offer level playing fields to every member of the Football Association to be able to be competitive. Okay? And I think that we did a, a good job um, um, engaging, our members, yourself and engaging our members, speaking with our members, offering them opportunity to, for feedback opportunities. It's always the, the way to go, and uh, the Football Association will not depart from that. Of course, those who go with what um, are always brought in line by way of the approved processes within the football uh, structure. One of your major campaign promises, which you know Ghanaians have seen being implemented, is the ball hole project for a lot of clubs, and I think that major beneficiaries of this project. At Division One League clubs, we've seen some centres. We saw videos of uh, the Sunyani Coronation Park having the construction of their boho and other areas. You know, Pram Pram have also have theirs, and it, it keeps going. How are the other centres going to get theirs, and 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 how is this particular project, you know, gladdening your hearts? Well, um, the the boho project is part of a clear strategy aimed at improving competitions, okay? How do we do that? Um, we want to ensure that our pitches are healthy, and how can that be achieved? That can only be achieved if there's regular flow of water, hence our investment in the borehole strategy. In all, we, we're, constructing 20, we're constructing 80 boreholes across the country. Okay. Um, at the moment, I think that 60 have been uh, constructed. 60? Uh, 60 have been constructed. Wow. And, and, and soon, the last batch will be, will, be, will be done, will be in place. And once water starts to flow all over the country, I'm sure everybody will, will start to enjoy. What's most important is life beyond the construction of the borehole. How do we effectively use, use the borehole? How do we keep our pitches healthy? And how do we ensure that the boreholes are kept in, in a safe manner?
to ensure that a lifespan is not is so short. Okay, so so there, there will be a, a lot of engagement opportunities between our, our good cells and our members, just to ensure that there's regular flow of water, and our pitches are always healthy, and and of course that will result in good players being produced by the coaches. Footballs, clubs, you know. Division One League clubs, of which I was a member, so I'm privy to the number of balls that clubs had last season. 40 footballs were given to clubs last season. The previous season were 50, then 40. The quantum of balls that are given to clubs. We say football, it's all about balls. balls. <laughs> Isn't it? So without balls, football, there, there are it's no, all there's about no football. Balls. And without footballs, without balls, there will not be football. Okay, so, so again, um, the, through our relationships that we establish, including uh, the relationship we have with uh, um, uh, Tempo, we have Tempo balls that will be coming in soon. Um, let me be the first to admit that it has delayed. Uh, some of the balls have, 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 have delayed, but I'm very positive that in the next two weeks or thereabout, uh, we'll have some of the balls coming through. Um, again, we're going to repeat the same strategy this year. Clubs, we've already uh, clubs have already been informed that they're going to receive 40 footballs uh, for the Division One clubs. Uh, Premier League clubs are going to receive 50, and women clubs are going to receive. Uh, they have actually received theirs already okay. via our partnership with the Catalan. Okay, um, so so um, we we intend to stay in that line. We intend to invest more in footballs and to ensure that. Footballs are available to every footballer in our dear country. The major highlight for women's football, especially at the club level, was the performance of Hazakes ladies uh, in the Wafu Championship. From the local scene, they won the Women's Premier League, the Women's FA Cup, they went to Wafu, they won the Wafu Women's uh, Champions League, and they went to the Champions League proper and did a very good job there. We know the FA played a very key role in getting Hazakes ladies get to that far. But as the president of the FA, when you saw the progress of Hazakes ladies, what was it telling you? Let me again use this opportunity to say kudos to Hazakes ladies, especially uh, to um, the leader of the team, Uncle Nap, we call him, uh, to Evelyn Sia, to coach um, Yusuf Basigi. Yusuf Basigi and to all the players led by Janet Ejiri. I think that they have not only made themselves proud, they've made me proud and they've made Ghana football proud. It encourages me, it encourages the executive committee to do more for women's football because they have just reconfirmed what we've all believed in, that women's football, if encouraged, encouraged will take Ghana to a level that we all desire. Don't forget that in 1999, the Black Queens were the first to, to, to take Ghana to the Senior World Cup. Yes. In 1999, yeah. the Black Queens of Ghana were the first senior national team to take Ghana to a Senior World Cup. Yeah. Okay, so they have shown that if you give them the right levels of support, they can deliver. Certainly. And, and, and the performance of Azaka's ladies gives all of us the, the belief that it can be done. It also tells all of us that our women's league is of the highest quality. And this year, the Women's League are going to receive more attention by way of sponsorship and they are going to be more visible on free-to-air TV through our partnership with Max TV. Okay, the live games will be available for everybody to watch and I think this is the, the highest level of motivation we can offer our girls who, 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 um, who, uh, who belong to that uh, industry. I mean, women's football live on TV, Charlie, you know, busy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe today I not get nothing, yeah. but tomorrow I go get something. Tomorrow too, I go get something. And but I, I go, go buy, buy moto for mama. For mama, ah, oh. mama, you do, you do. <laughs> Charlie, mama, they pray Everybody for me. knows that Shatawale is your favorite musician in Ghana. We want to hear you sing a song from Shatawale oh. today. <laughs> I can't can I, can I put you on the spotlight? <laughs> I believe you are, you, are, you are really, really, really into this particular uh, chat with the president of the Ghana Football Association. You are enjoying it, but they say that the journey of 100 miles begins with a step and certainly ends somewhere. But ends also with a step. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> but before we end with that particular step, um, the president will give us his New Year message. Uh, certainly being the president of the Football Association, 
he must speak to his community, the football community. I think that, um, first of all, I thank God that all of us are alive. I'm still here because of the support all our members showed to me um, two years ago. I'm still here because of the belief that all our members have in me and, and, and my executive committee to, to work towards a much, much, much better football ecosystem. I'm glad that we are into a new year, a new year offered to us by the Almighty God to continue our service, not only to mankind, but to football in this country. I pray that the Almighty God will keep all of us together. We will differ in opinions, but I pray that he'll give us good health. He will give us the spirit of loving one another, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of believing that together we can ignite passion and create world for everybody the spirit of believing that if we stay together, we can bring back the love. And believe me, the love is so close to us. The love is so close to us. I will urge every one of us to just stretch our hands and see whether we cannot reach out to the love that we so desire. And I believe that 2022 will be a year of major achievements for Ghana football. A year of glory, a year of love, a year of hope. I love each one of you, and I pray that God should keep us together. And I pray that together with me, together with your executive committee, we will take Ghana football to the promised land. I wish each one of you a fishapa, a fishapa. I believe we wish this does not end, but certainly we have to end it. You have enjoyed our interaction with the president of the Ghana Football Association. As I keep telling you all the time, we are bringing you this and many more on the Ghana Football app. Stick and stay with us. We'll bring you nothing but the best. Thanks for being with us.